soul and Adam came to life. Before that, Adam was just earth. By the way, the word Adam, Adam in Hebrew, comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which means from the earth. Eve's name in Hebrew is Chava, which means she who what? Gives birth, creates life. So, was there only one, this one couple, Mr. and Mrs. Adam and Eve, and all human beings came from that? Ah, no. It's really Adam and Eve represent all human beings. Adam is all guys, <laughs> Eve is all women. <laughs> People love this trick question to rabbis. Oh, it couldn't have been only an Adam and Eve because then they had two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, and then Cain got married. Where'd the girl come from? Ha ha, rabbi, see, you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> The Bible doesn't actually say that God only created Adam and Eve. They are archetypes or examples of all human beings. And their highly dysfunctional family also can sound like some of our families. Hopefully no murder in anyone's family here. Um, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Any yeah, of course, anytime. Thank you. Need a body to have a soul. Do animals have a soul? What did the Jews believe? Yes. But a different a different level of soul because not all animals, although well, we're learning more about animals and communication than we do. Uh, so in other words, uh, God has not commanded an animal to like Shabbat candles, obviously. Okay, and I don't think there are any I don't know, Jewish animals, although I, I no, I never tried to circumcise a dog. No. <laughs> I've, I've asked about that though to people. As you know, they say, "Oh, my dog's Jewish." I said, "Well, you can circumcise him." Okay. They said, well, we knew to him. That's close, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a little further. Very close. My dog had a bark mitzvah. Yeah, he would be close. Yes. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. No, but honestly, yeah. what, what's the story with this? There is a discussion amongst the Kabbalists as to whether animals can actually, um, when they die, can they, do they have a soul that can exist in another plane? I'll hold off on that thought because I'll talk about reincarnation in a little while. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then the question, of, obviously, the question also is animal, I mean, plants uh, have emotional states, uh, but obviously they would like to think, although I know some people who basically are, I say, boy, you 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 got the mind of a cucumber, mm -hmm. but um, the fact is that obviously plants are on a different level of existence than us. They're always believed, uh, I got this straight, within Kabbalah, there are different levels of the soul. There's an animated soul that we have, a conscious level soul, and then there is a simply a growth, a, a human, a, 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 a someach, a growing soul of life itself soul. Uh, and then even God is in this too, even though it's an inanimate object. Okay. So. Rabbi, there are a lot of people on now. Do you want to come around? Come around, come around. Let me entertain you. Let me make you smile. Oh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Hi, Rabbi. Now, yeah, we have such great looking people in this temple. Oh. Okay, did you hear what I was trying to say already? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Okay. When they're smiling, look happy. Of course, they're not in the rain in this cold weather. That's that. I, I I really do feel that animals have a soul because some of the things that animals do yeah. are so wonderful and so loving and so caring that I, they have to have a soul. Right. Okay. I really don't know exactly what is a soul. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> Kabbalah. Now, if you were to go into the Bible and remember again, I mentioned this long ago, that Judaism is an evolving religion. So certainly the earliest parts of the Torah, the Bible, uh, the concept of, let us say, the soul or the afterlife or existence is very different than it was later on. But actually, but to say that, number one, is there is a concept of a soul in the Bible, in the early parts, but it is not a, co a soul with consciousness. It is, uh, let's just basically say, living. So in Adam, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he came to life. Similar again, when we are born, we are born with an in-breath. We inhale, and they slap us on the back, and we go, right? 
I mean, as an out breath, we slap his back up, we cry, and then we start life. So God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he took the first breath out, and it all began. Notice what? Giving and receiving a flow back and forth. But that is all that's described in the early parts of the Bible. The soul is the activation part of the human, bringing him up from the dust of the dirt. Uh, how many of you ever heard of a golem? G-O-L-E-M, okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, there, there was a, a movie about a golem had it, something, a mystery or something, um, with Robbie somebody. Anyway, there was a very famous rabbi in Prague called Yehuda, Lo, uh, Yehuda Halevi, Yehuda Leib of Prague, uh, and um, the tradition is uh, that uh, the Jews in, the, in Prague were being attacked all the time by the Christians and the Cossacks and whatever, and he needed help. And so he had read in the mystical text that you can create a hermuncula or an, a human being from clay. Mm -hmm. And so he formed a bodily image of clay, similar to Adam, let's say. And then what he did was he didn't breathe into it and, and whatever like God did with Adam, but rather he inscribed on his forehead the letters Aleph Mem Tav, which spell the word Emet, which means truth. And all of a sudden, this piece of clay, this blob on the floor, opened its eyes and became a golem. And the golem is sort of like a Frankenstein story. The mm -hmm. golem is very, very powerful and started killing all the Cossacks and beating up all the people and defending the Jews. But as happens in the movies too, the golem got a little out of hand. And so it was time to put the golem to sleep. And so the way to do that is, remember, Aleph, Mem, Tav, Emet. But if you erase the Aleph from the word Emet, you're left with Mem and Tav, which spells the word mate or death. And so he was able to somehow get the quiet, quieted down the golem, erase the Aleph, and then the golem died. Pretty good. So in the early parts of the Bible, you simply have the soul as an animation of life. Basically, what would happen was in the early parts of the Bible, death, and obviously the body, everyone's body, and I would not take the, the ages in the early parts of the Bible literally, that Methuselah lived to 900 and people lived to 800, 700 years. They most definitely counted differently than we do today. Dog well, years. question, Dog years, maybe, or, well, um, but on the other hand, uh, for instance, we mathematically have a base 10 system. In biblical times, based upon Babylonian influence, particularly when much of the Bible was probably written, worked in a base 60 system in mathematics. So you're definitely going to get a whole different sense of, of math and counting, etc. However, they had the sense that the body dies, but they believed that this soul thing, whatever it was, ended up going to basically sort of like the American, Native American idea of a happy hunting ground. People went with their fathers and were buried with their ancestors. In some place, and one of the words quite often used in the Bible is called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, which basically the place of eternal sleep. But everyone went there, whether you're good or bad, um, but you just stayed there. And there was no individuality, although supposedly um, King Saul, the first king of Israel, needed to consult someone who had died earlier, and he was actually able to find a witch to bring that person back from Sheol. Okay, but leaving aside that story, is, is that you have this place called Sheol or the netherworld where people went. So if anyone were to say to you, well, Jews do not believe in life after death, you can turn to them and say they are 110% incorrect. We do. And we have to believe in life after death for one simple reason. If God animated us, this blob on the ground, and gave us life, God is someone who is not going to be someone who gives life and simply allows it to end when this, this machine that is animated by the soul stops functioning. If God is good, then ultimately there must be a life after this one where what is happening in this world is worked out. Of course, the great story in, in the Bible, the book of Job, 
uh, where we talked about this, I think, where this righteous man uh, is, uh, is tested by God and the accuser, Satan. Uh, but the fact is, is, is that our lives are very short and stuff is going to happen. Bad stuff can happen to almost anyone, as we all know, any moment of life. But whatever happens now is balanced off by a life which would be eternal. So the Bible definitely does believe in, number one, obviously, people die. But also, the soul survives the death of the body. So, what then does this mean? I, I'm thinking of the following idea. It's coming to my mind. Let me go back a little bit and give a couple of quotes. Is, is that, again, speaking about this body part, uh, Abraham said, Ani afar, I am but dust and ashes. We're familiar with the expression from dust to ashes. We understand that this bodily form does eventually, it's only material. It's only biological stuff, right? And it ceases to function. And so we had to believe that there is that which is greater than us, that is our operating system with God. In the rabbinic period, you begin to have, which goes back 2,000 years ago, maybe even 21, 2,200 years ago, goes, much of it goes even back further to the Greek period. And it was in the Greek and Roman influence of the Jews that something amazing happened. And that was what's called individual consciousness after we died. Well, I remember um, I, I took an arts and music survey class a long time ago. And hopefully I'm still correct about this thought. And that is, before the Greek and Roman period, when they did statues, the statues were basically stylized statue. Every statue looked the same. They had the same face. They looked the same. But with the Greek, particularly I think what it was with the Greek period, is that statues began to look like the people they were making the statues for. Because all of a sudden, the individual made a difference. Jew, Judaism was affected by this consciousness of the individual. And therefore, in the rabbinic period, when a person died, you no longer went to Sheol, this place where everybody went, but rather the development in the rabbinic period of what's called in Hebrew, olam haba, or the world to come, or the world that is becoming into the next stage of existence. In this world, the next world, Olam Haba, there are two main locations. One is Gan Eden, which is the, the Garden of Eden, which is the Hebrew way of saying heaven, the higher spiritual worlds. The other is on the other extreme called Gehenna, G-E-H-I-N-N-O-M, which is the Jewish version of hell. So therefore, you learned a nice word today. If you say to someone, go to, you can go to Gehenna as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> most people, most likely, they ain't going to know what you mean. So you got your weapons, but they are, you know, ah, try that one, see what happens. Okay. So anyway, is, is that they began to have the development of the concept that a person, after the body dies, the soul will go first, everyone's soul first goes to the Gehenna part where there is a period of judgment to assess how did they live? What did they do? What didn't they do? Every time we do a good deed, a mitzvah, the tradition tells us, an angel is formed on our behalf. And so that therefore, when we're in the lower world, Gehenna, and God wants to see what we did, is that these angels are going to be our defending lawyers. The defense lawyers, they're going to stand up and say, oh, Sheila did this and that and the other thing. Okay. Then after a very, for most of us, after a very short period of time, but remember, time means nothing in the spiritual realm, is that our soul then ascends to Gan Eden. There it will stay for a certain period of time. And this then becomes the complicated part of all of this. If you didn't think this was already complicated. Sometime in the future, 
the Mashiach or the Messiah will come. And those of you at my services a couple of two weeks ago, I talked about the concept of the Messiah at the end of time. When the Mashiach comes, the second temple, the third temple will now be built in Jerusalem. Good luck. Very good. Okay. I'll talk about the war of Gaza now and Hamas. Anyway, but also what will happen is what is called Tehiyat Hametim or the resurrection of the dead. And at that time, all the dead, now you might say Jewish dead, non Jewish dead, dead animals, the dogs and the cats that died, who's going to be resurrected? Well, let's just leave it in traditional Jewish terms. And that is all of the Jews who have ever died will be brought back to life. We could add possibly the righteous of every all peoples will be brought back to life. Now, of course, Alan's sitting here and, and saying, what? Okay, <laughs> okay. After all, if you dig up a grave 30 years after a person died, you're going to, assuming that's not in a metal casket, you're going to just find what? You just find bones, right? So how is this person, what is that going to be? Well, there were some Jewish thinkers who literally said that the actual body will come back to existence. Now, you might say, well, let's say I, I live to 95 years old and this hurts and that hurts. And I broke this and I broke that. And uh, my kishkes have like whatever. Uh, when I come back to life, is it going to be the when I died? Is that the way I'm going to come back? Nah. Forget, about Forget about it, it right? Forget Leave me in the ground. About okay. about now, Jews took this idea so seriously that they actually buried people with shovels in their casket in the Middle Ages in order to shovel their way back to Israel. Because the question is, how are they going to get there? Because they have to be resurrected in the state of Israel, in the country of Israel. How are they going to get back there? And they're going to tunnel their way back with shovels in a process called in Hebrew Gilgulim, which means tunneling. And of course you could say, what? Okay, and that would certainly be deserving of a big what question. How is that gonna happen? Well, the shovel isn't very rich. Yeah, in the casket. In the casket. Right, so it's right there for them. Sure, to grab on. <laughs> well, no wonder I haven't heard from my husband. <laughs> I forgot the shovel. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the spring lock to get out of the cabin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so can I just yeah. ask a question? So there's the tradition where if someone's passed, newly passed, you have watchers right. to keep their soul protected. Is that have anything to do with this? Yes, aspect? because the because the soul. Oh, I'll take a step. Uh, let me see if I should finish this part first. Um, okay, we'll leave that. My uh, leave me back. Leave us off at we'll the resurrection of the dead. Right. In Kab in Jewish tradition, as it began to develop in, let us say, the rabbinic period. That's I'm talking about the first second centuries of the common era, and more powerfully later on in the Kabbalah, which began really in the ninth century of the common era. You have the belief that there are actually not just one level of the soul, but we actually have five levels of the soul. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Kaya, and Yechida. The Nefesh level of the soul comes about upon conception. So in other words, when that sperm and egg get together, yes, life begins. So you might, I don't think I talked about abortion, did I? No, okay. In, did I? Yeah, okay. So in Judaism, there we do, the Talmud actually speaks about it. So the document 2,000 years old does allow for abortion up until, actually, according in the Talmud, it states until the head appears in the birth process. If the mother's life is being threatened and she can, is the, are you committing murder? I mean, you read these ads and all the stuff today about abortion discussions and politics. Um, Yes, the mother is committing murder, but is murder due to self-defense. And under Talmudic law, you allowed the right, every person has the right of self-defense. And they felt that the mother's life is takes pre precedence over the fetus's life, because if you think back 2,000 years ago, how many fetuses, how many babies even came into birth? 
or lived maybe a month or two more, mm -hmm. which is why they would have 10, 11, 12 kids. Because if they were lucky, two of them lived to adulthood. Today, it's obviously very different. But the fact is, is that Judaism has always allowed for abortion based upon the idea of viewing the fetus as a, uh, a possible one to commit murder and the mother's allowed the self-defense. So yes, the nefesh comes about upon conception. The next level is called the ruach, which means breath. When the baby takes its first breath, that is called the ruach, the first breath. The neshama, the neshama, comes about later on in life, shortly thereafter, as we begin to develop our higher level of a soul, particularly our moral and spiritual and ethical dimensions. When we're able to think beyond simply filling our own mouth and pooping, okay, as a baby, then all of a sudden we are developing our neshama. Most people do not ever develop or have a sense of achaya and yafida. These are very, very high spiritual levels, which really are only developed by spiritual practitioners of the higher learnings of Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism further connectors to God, becoming more aware of God all the time in very special and holy ways. So let's leave Chaya and Yechida out. Okay. So let's take the neshama, nefesh, ruach, and nefesh. They came into the body, nefesh, ruach, and the neshama. And therefore, they leave in the same way. The neshama, according to some scholars, <clears throat> thinkers, leaves 30 days before a person dies. The higher level begins going back to that moment of death, actually before that, but each one of these five levels has five levels in them, okay? There's an infinite number of all of these things I'm speaking about. So within the nefesh, there's a nefesh of the nefesh, there's a nefesh of the ruach, there's a nefesh of the uh, neshama, there's a nefesh of the chaya, there's a nefesh of the yachida. So each one of these five levels has five levels in them. And you have to go through all of these different levels as the soul begins to leave the body Am I understanding more or less what I'm trying to say? But it is that not all of the neshama leaves. Some of the parts of the neshama stay, but other parts of the neshama leave. If any of you have ever been with a loved one, or I'm assuming it would be a loved one, uh, who is terminally ill, and you, and that certainly from my experience, not only with my parents and Judy's parents, and Judy's mother particularly, a father unfortunately died during surgery, uh, so he didn't have a dying process Uh down in a wonderful hospital in Fort Lauderdale, uh, where they should have only done they they came, he had he had uh, gone in for heart surgery, uh, and they had already done two valves, and the surgeon came out in the middle of the operation and said, "I really think you should do a third. This is an eighty-seven year old man. We should do a third valve." And we said, "What do you think?" He said, "Well, I would do it." So he did, and guess what? Sid died. He's, he's, he, they couldn't keep his his heart pressure up enough, and that was the end. Yeah. But, it, but in terms of Judy's mother and my two parents. And in the experience that I've had otherwise and it's slow in my hospital work as well as hospice work is, is that I've seen this where you can't say literally 30 days, but there's a period of time when a person who is dying begins to separate from the living. Um, and they do this because you could say, you can explain this psychologically in many ways, uh, but also you can explain it in terms of the higher levels of their soul, the neshama particularly, begin the spiritual journey. Much of the literature deals with that spirit of life after death stuff. I think I'm one again. Oh. Okay. Uh, big, much of the spiritual life uh, really uh, deals with describing uh, what's going to happen afterward. And also the fact is that the midnight soul begins to leave. There's the process going back to judging, but the judgment. Because there's prosecuting angels also who want to keep us down and that allow us to rise up. Okay. At, at, at the risk of sounding really pretty, uh, not very bright. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> this idea that, that I simply said the heaven and the hell, would it, is that a reform uh, thought or is that 
Traditional Judaism. What I'm telling you today is traditional Judaism. Okay, because at the right day that I have read, I have never heard that there was a hell. My thought was that that yours, and it was never even clear. It was like you died and your soul kind of went up and became part of whatever. Yeah. I, I've never heard that. This is the truth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the, to answer your question, is that the higher levels of the soul begin to rise at a certain period of time than the Shama levels. But remember, some of the Neshama levels stay within the body. Some begin their spiritual journey to Olam Haba, to Gan Eden, or to Gehenna, to go through a process of judgment. What's going to happen there in that, that dimension, I like the word dimension, not worlds, I'll, have to, I'll talk about in a moment. Because this is where it is my understanding that reincarnation has to come into play in Judaism. Just a quick story, very, very quick. I'm a nurse. Worked with Sloan Kettering too, did hospice, all that. Had this one guy in the Jewish home of the elderly, Fairfield, Connecticut, his name is Carl. <laughs> Dying. They called me in, no pulse, nothing. All right. Well, so, but he was still there for a kid. I laid down beside him and said, Carl, oh, it's okay, you better go, go. No pulse, nothing, waiting. Two minutes later, I'm back. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. He's um, back. Where were you? I was around the world. What'd you see? I said, I saw everybody. And what happened? He goes, my wife said, not time yet. I go, when you going back? When you leave it? He goes, in two weeks. I go, okay. I made it 10 days. Mm -hmm. Right? So he's the only guy I ever met. And I've dealt with a lot of death and dying. Who mm -hmm. I thought was dead. And... He came back and uh, told me you uh, actually oh. found more on the story. Oh. Well, <laughs> oh my well, we can. I mean, there are many stories. Uh, where some of you heard my bike accident story, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, where my the, this I actually spoke to an emergency room nurse who retired, uh, who uh, is into spiritual things also. And when I was hit with this bicycle, I was just riding along, and the next moment, we're looking into an EMT's face. So a period of time must have gone by that I was unconscious. And this person said that God took my neshama, my higher spiritual level, out of my body because I actually saw my head hitting the ground twice. Oh and then when it was time for me to come back, they, God saved my life by taking out my neshama because if my neshama was still in my body, I would have died and put it back in my body. And that's when all of a sudden my eyes popped open. And I saw this EMT. And I said, I got a bat I got a bat mitzvah I got to get to. <laughs> but, but actually a couple of weeks ago, um, I was down in Boca and there's this guy, I was, I was talking to him about selling a bike, buying a bike. And um, he's one of these like totally Meshuggah bike riders. He rides his bike 70 miles an hour, some insane amount of time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was riding with a group of riders and the guy in front of him hit something. He went down and this guy went flying over the bicycle and went skidding face down along the, the concrete. Uh -huh. And according to him, his entire face all of it was scraped off completely and he died and he he's christian so he sees his brother who had died previously he saw his parents who had previously died and his brother took his hand and his brother said to him do you want to see jesus and he said really yeah and all of a sudden his brother changed into jesus whatever that means i guess for whatever okay and took him on the journey throughout the world and in special places, whatever. And then Jesus said to him, and he said, can I stay with you? And Jesus said, no, it's time for you to come back again. He it, Then all of a sudden he opened his eyes and this EMT or whoever the ambulance was there, obviously, and cops were there, you can imagine what was going on. And um, they said to him, you have no face, you're in terrible shape, don't move. And all of a sudden he died a second time. And this time he saw God and God took his hand the second time. And then he got into an ambulance. He died a third time. Um, you can't explain these things. You only can say it is what it is. Did it happen? He believed it happened. And therefore we have to believe it happened. But he did not survive. Yeah. He he not survive. It was 10 years later. He still rises by 40 miles an hour. Oh, my God. Yeah. He has like 11. He was in 11 accidents. 
like maybe you should ride slower and whatever. Anyway, uh, but maybe the fact he likes the experience of dying. Well, getting the you got, well get off your but the fact is, is people have these experiences. But okay, let me get back. Oh, wow. So therefore, the ruach. So the person has died. But remember, we come back. We come into life by an out breath, an in breath rather. But we leave life with an exhalation. Our breath goes out. So the breath, the ruach leaves. The nefesh, the low, that biological part that began upon conception, remains in the body and remains in the ground with our biological elements until they are totally absorbed in the earth and they never are completely. Okay. So that therefore, there is a part of the nefesh in the body, in the ground, which is, according to this idea, resurrected to chiatimetim later on in the future. Now, don't get too anxious because most of us are not going to live now 300 years more, okay? However, this is the year 5784 in the Jewish calendar. According to one of the beliefs is that the cycle that we are going through before the Mashiach comes will be the year 6,000. So 5784 from 6,000, 200, uh, not too many. Well, <laughs> none of us, who, I don't think that we might be back, however. Okay. So therefore, you see the process of the neshama, nefesh, ruach, that is in constant motion all the time. So we have a biological part. Our nefesh is operative all the time. Our ruach, if you can't breathe, you have no life. Uh, we have a dear friend who was in, in um, Miami Hospital last week where he specialized in cystic fibrosis. Her name is Phyllis. Sometimes I mentioned to her in, in the Mishabayrak mm -hmm. prayer. And she was the, she's the oldest person. She was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at the age of 50. No one has ever, because she had pancreatic, pancreatic cystic fibrosis and originally not lung fibrosis, cystic fibrosis. But now it's gone to the lung. And she, she we talked to her the other day. She can barely speak on the phone. She has no breath left. And she should have two, a double lung transplant, but she's definitely not eligible for it because she's now weighing about 90 pounds. So anyway, the breath is obviously our life. So we now understand, you understand, you hear this, that in Judaism, we do believe in a soul that animates us and functions on these various levels. Now, I'm going to share something with you have I read this before? I don't know. I don't think so. Yes, please come. What does it mean when you say we have a soul that animates us? Without our soul, we don't live. It is our operating system. Yeah. For instance. But different than the breath. Well, the breath, the nefesh is when, so for instance, if, we t if I take this laptop and I turn it off, it's just a metal, okay? It ain't doing nothing, okay? The minute I press the plug it in and press the on button, that's the nefesh. The minute then, but it starts to activate, brings up the programs, we could say that's the ruach. Huh, okay. My eyes open, I have breath. I can I can live, I can move. Of course, this thing's not gonna move anywhere. We'll have a robot someday, don't worry. But anyway, we have a robot rabbi. Uh, okay. Robbie, Robbie robot, Ra rabbi Roby. Rabbi Roby. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, but anyway, that's the that's that part. Okay, but then the neshama would be, guess what? We turn the Wi-Fi on. And the Wi-Fi then is the higher activation system that allows this little thing here or this little, even smaller thing here to be connected with the entire world. I can connect to anywhere in the world using this little tiny device. That's the neshama. And therefore, yeah, if I, I, I turn the Wi-Fi off, the neshama goes. I turn the thing off, I, right? You know, so you, and then you can reverse the process. But the beautiful thing about it all is this thing still needs us. Whereas all I need is God. A greater activation system. Okay, that's your question? Okay, so... I'm going to, this is my, my, after studying these things for a long time, notice there's a gap here, okay? The soul, Alan, is in the hell, Gehenna, and Gan Eden, the hell, heaven. Uh, oh, cute story. Uh, there is a taxi cab driver and a rabbi who die on the same day. 
and they appear before the heavenly court, because there's a belief in the heavenly court in Judaism, uh, where the angels and God are there waiting for our neshama to come up and to be judged. Where we're going to go, what's going to happen to us. So the cab driver comes first, and God says, well, who are you? And he says his name. And he uh, looks him up and he says, oh, yeah, you're that cab driver, right? Yeah, yeah, that was me. Well, you're going to sit right in the front row here in the auditorium. And you get the best seat in the house right by my right side. And you have complete access, uh, unlimited access to the buffet. And you can watch any movie you want to any time of the day. Wow, really? Yes, please sit there. The rabbi comes up next and says, who are you, rabbi? Introduce himself. And God says, well, Rabbi, you've done a very good job of bringing people to Torah and, and prayer. Um, you're in row 542. I, I Don't be upset. Right now, you have a place behind a pillar. I know you're going to miss some of the movies. You can bend over left and right. But, but don't worry. As time goes on, people move around a little bit. I'll, I promise you, I'll move you up. So the rabbi says, oh, the, you are the almighty. You are the God of everything, of the universe. I, I'm, in you, all humility, I don't mean to question you. But that uh, that cab driver, he has the best seat in the house, and I'm in 546 behind a pillar. It, it, I'm going to question you, is that right? And God says to him, obviously, Rabbi, you never were the passenger in his cab. He had more people praying harder ever in his cab than they ever did in your synagogue. All right. Da -dum, da -dum. Okay. <laughs> da -dum, da -dum. Okay. So I like that joke. But the question becomes is, I've left a gap here. Because if you you really can't apply, everyone makes, am I making sense, everyone? Okay. You really can't apply rational questions to anything I've said to you before, so far, right? I mean, it's not rational. There's no proof, there's no proof number one. Um, and there's no, it's not rational. We can use our thinking brain in this whole thing. But if you think about it, there's something lacking here. What happens when the soul is in Gan Eden finally, or Gehenna, and they're there, and you so, and then there's the Dechiat Hametim, the resurrection of the dead, but also some of the traditions say, well, not everyone's going to be resurrected because the people in Gehenna, they're stuck there and all that stuff. And one of the most important principles in Judaism, which of course we all know about from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is Vat repentance. But guess what? When a soul is stuck those places, can it repent? No, because it doesn't have a what? Body. Right. It's a disembodied soul. Re within the last period of time, a couple of years, maybe something, it dawned on me, and by the way, my teacher of Kabbalah in Jerusalem, I study with him twi or twice a month, Eliyahu uh, Shir, uh, does, says, he, this is what his understanding is also, this is where the Kabbalists, not in rabbinic Judaism, they were stuck with this. This is their, and they went into many descriptions about heaven, about hell, about how people are judged and whatnot. They came up with ideas how long this is going to happen for, like I said, 6,000 years in the Jewish calendar. But it never made much sense to me until I started really studying Kabbalah and was called Gilgulim or reincarnation. Judaism must have a period of reincarnation before the final end of time because it gives the opportunity for a neshama to come back into a body form in order to commit to what? To do teshuva, to repent for their previous sins. Because how many mitzvot are there? 613. In order for a soul, according to one belief, in order for a soul to eventually be resurrected, you have to fulfill all 613 mitzvot. We've got a lot of problems with that. Number one is the majority of the mitzvot occurred when the temple in Jerusalem was, and not today. There's no temple. You can't do those things. Number two is there are certain mitzvot which a woman could do, and I'm obviously in this body form, not a woman, or vice versa. And by the way, you can get a whole discussion about uh, um, LBT. GTQ and all the plus things uh, with the soul stuff and and what you're fulfilling in this life, okay? You can get a lot of discussion about that and, and understand it, maybe even better. Because you're basically dealing always with a past life experience and you need to come back in order to do the shuva in order to rectify a tikkun 
of your past misdeeds so that you continue on this journey. Because guess what? It's similar to a video game. You have nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yachida. And you have, remember, nefesh benefesh. Okay, you have five in each level. Your soul has to go through all, what? Five times five is 25? Okay. 25 levels. You got to get to the top. Chaim Vital, one of the great Kabbalists, uh, living in the 15th, uh, 16th uh, century in Spain and later in Sfat, uh, in northern Israel, uh, said that we are allowed up to 1,000 lifetimes in order to go through this process. Some of us probably need a lot more. Okay, but now going back to dogs and cats and etc. Before you go to dogs and cats, Rabbi? Yeah. Why? I, I understand you. Look. Why can't it be that you are stuck in there? Why, why, why your the assumption is that that you'd want to repent, God would want to get what why that's an assumption. Why would it be that you might be stuck there? Because God is mercy. And one of God's chief qualities is many people think, especially some people think of the Jewish God, the Jewish concept of God, he's always punished. It is punishing, you know, you better make sure you're an audience nice, to, you know, okay. Um, it's always punishing and rewarding. But the fact is, is that a greater principle in Judaism, which unfortunately they were Christian thinkers who didn't see this, is that our God is a merciful God. Adonai, Adonai, Arachum, Bechanun, the Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, the 13 attributes of mercy, as explained to Moses in Exodus. So therefore, if God is merciful, then God will allow us to repent in order to be forgiven and to correct our sins. Otherwise, the whole system makes no sense. Um, nothing, make, would make, nothing in Judaism would make any sense whatsoever if God wasn't chief. The emphasis is on God's mercy. Betty? The problem I have is every time you are reincarnated, you also have opportunity to do something wrong that you then have to repent. That's why I need a thousand times around. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, does it ever end? Well, well, what does it mean, actually? Because I said to Rabbi Shear, well, how do I know where I am? Am I in level 20? Am I mm -hmm. in the first row, the last row? Where am I? And he said, it really doesn't matter because the key is you just got to be the best Jew you can be and the best human being you can be and not worry about where you live, where you, where you are. So, um, so you don't know what happened in the past life to repent. Well, most probably not. Right. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure that there were some Kabbalistic masters who are on the high and Yehida levels who actually understand that mm. through meditation. Uh, and they're on such high levels. I've only read about them uh, that they probably do know that. Lubavitch mm. Rebbe, other play people like this, who really operate on a different plane uh, than the average person. And there are other, and other religions, too, have special holy people, obviously. Uh, Rabbi? I, uh, Rabbi? Yes, a disembodied Someone speaking. I, I, I believe Judy has a question. She's been waving I her do. hand for a while. I do. Thank oh, you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Just speaking. Um, so recently, I spoke to a friend of mine who lost her husband uh, in Canada. And um, when she went to finalize all the funeral arrangements, they said, yes, you have this and this and this and the five doves. And she said, what the heck are you talking about? So at the five doves, which she never heard of, and neither had I, I told her I would ask you, do they have any relevance to carrying your soul away? Have you ever heard of the five doves? Let's start are with that doves, Are the doves alive or dead? Oh, they're alive. Oh, they're alive. I have no idea. I never heard that. Never one. heard of it. Well, that funeral guy. Okay, so that's irrelevant. I will tell her that. No, sorry. Yes, <laughs> okay. I'm wondering about burial. Oh, some question about burial. Uh -huh. You go throw your body in the casket. Some people now prefer to incinerate mm -hmm. is there what's what, what's the stance on that ah well judaism definitely is against traditional judaism is definitely against cremation because you're you are changing intentionally changing the bodily form and not enabling the biological elements to naturally return back to the earth uh there's a a uh, traditional Jewish cemetery up on Lantana, on uh, Congress, I think it is, mm -hmm. like South Florida, whatever. Yeah. And Judy and I were looking for grave into buying graves down here. Um, went over there, and we decided for other, many, some reason, other reasons, but one reason definitely because they require a traditional, a real tradition like Israel burial, not in a casket but on a flat board. Right. And Judy okay. says she's not doing that. <laughs> yeah, but we're supposed to return back. 
so that yes are people in a fire god forbid or something and the body uh, cremated look what's happening in, in war and stuff yes but here you're intentionally doing that and therefore you're intentionally changing the body bodily form which is why traditional judaism <laughs> was against it cremation R rabbi going back to you but, where, where uh, the oh i'm sorry i was gonna say but obviously in in the modern world today i i would say and even in our temple the majority of people are opting of all ages not just young people people some of our temple members in the 90s almost uh, more than not people are opting today for cremation for various reasons uh but again traditional judaism absolutely not now, according like, to the book the cremation they say okay but you something about putting the urn and burying it you, well you can bury you can bury god bless you, you can bury an urn but on the other hand people are saying i don't want to be i want to be cremated god bless you because i don't want my kids to have to bother about burying me in a place well guess what sometimes having a place to go to is important psychologically and therefore those people are robbing their children of that on the other hand as i always say to people if they say to me well Albert, what do you think and I'm, I'm not sure yet i said just where do you intend to ask for your ashes to go okay and by the way i don't know how many of you have ever seen cremains um it's it's not like you think it is it's not ashes and the, the pelvic bone and the back bone back here cannot be burned completely. So there's actually real bones in there. Um, and I guess the two funny stories, I got to get back to my other stuff there. Okay, my two good stories is that um, uh, this this man calls me up, his father just died and asked me if I would officiate at the, the burial or whatever, a service for his cremains. I said, sure, where do, where do you want to do this? And so I said, well, dad always wanted his cremains to be scattered where he was born. So I said, well, that's a nice idea. Where is that? 47th Street and Broadway in Manhattan. I said, no, you can't do that. It's against the law. And then this other person, I was driving in a van uh, to a funeral in New Jersey, uh, and the driver was the son-in-law of the deceased. And uh, we're just going along. It's about a two hour schlep there. And um, he said to me, oh, and he's not Jewish. And he said to me, oh, Rabbi, I forgot to tell, I didn't get to tell you, my mother died last month. So I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, that's a proper response, right? Sorry to hear that. And then he said to me, yes, thank you. But I just want you to know, my mother is always very close to me. So the proper response is, yes, I'm sure she's in your heart. And then he said to me, well, yes, but she's also in the glove compartment. Because he actually, he actually put the cream mains in a Ziploc bag and has them in the glove compartment because he's always traveling. It doesn't look. Oh, you see, that's very nice. It's very cute. Yes. But you got to think about, people talk about cremation. Uh, but they don't think necessarily about what after. On the other hand, my two cousins, my first cousins, are still 10 years later fighting over the urn. One wants to bury it. The other wants to keep it. And they're actually, they contacted a lawyer at one point in time. Oh, no. And anyway, whatever. Okay. So getting back to the reincarnation and going back to animal forms is that Chaim Vital was very, very specific. He, and actually... He wrote two books uh, called Sefer Gilgulim, or the Book of Reincarnation. These are very, very complicated, very serious discussions about reincarnation because it has to do with what level out of the 25 levels you are at, what bodily forms you can come in. Um, and then there's a whole a major discussion in what is called Ebor, which means soul forms can inhabit other bodies. So I'll just give an example. Or, as a general example. Let's say, for instance, there was a Jewish person, or let us even say that there was a rabbi. And he was called by congregants to go visit in the hospital, and he never could do that. He never could fulfill the mitzvah of Bikucholim, of visiting the sick. He failed at that mitzvah. Out of the 613, that's one of the biggies. Failed at it. So I, thank God, have... I'm able to visit people in hospitals, et cetera. And that's something I've been doing now for over 50 years. I do it. I've done a lot of it. So it could be that he has become impregnated into my neshama with me, tags along with me. And by his tagging along with me, because his neshama identifies my neshama as being able to help him to fulfill that mitzvah. Because you ask, Betty, how can you fulfill those mitzvahs? Mm -hmm. Well, you can tag along with people who are able to fulfill those mitzvahs, and they get mitzvah credit. Mm -hmm. Not bad. 
But you might say, is Chaim Vital serious? Very much so. Now I'm going to take you to another place. Chaim Vital also believed that you can be reincarnated into animal forms. Mm. All right, I almost ran over that iguana the other day. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Anyway, <laughs> he did give this example. You can also be in, reincarnated reincarn into inanimate objects. Oh. Yeah. And he actually gives the following and made it into a ritual. I am sitting at lunch and Judy has made a sandwich for me. And I say the bracha over the sandwich. But let's say, for instance, there was a person in a previous lifetime who was a real mamzer. That's a Hebrew word for bastard. You say now another word. See, you say mamzer, you know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Teach you all these words today. It's not mm -hmm. good. I'm not supposed to teach these words. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, uh, those are the only words I know, bad words, so to speak, in Yiddish. Or did you... Okay, anyway. No, I know a couple more. Okay, anyway. Who am I talking to myself? Anyway. If you're getting answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, anyway, um, is is that there's a person who's real moms who's really a not nice person, never gives, never helps, never the people call up, can you do this? Never anything. So he then becomes incarnated. I know this is going to sound really bizarro, into the sandwich that I am about to eat. <laughs> and why? Because the food is going to enter into my body, which will now allow me to have the strength to continue with my day and to do what? To perform the mitzvahs that God wants me to do, to fulfill my mission. <clears throat> so he has now finally done something for somebody else. But the question then becomes, you could ask, well, how, how, does, that, how does that activate it? Because he can't... Where does he go? Where does he, he go? Well... He continue. Well, I have to. I have the ability to release his neshama from the grilled cheese sandwich by the following. Chaim Vital actually said that when you eat, you should, in addition to the bracha, bracha tadanayli, mostly like a minaris or whatever it is, you also can offer a kavanah or a meditation in the following way. As I'm about to eat this meal, I pray that if there are any neshamot souls that are incarnated into this food, I pray that as they are doing a mitzvah to allow me to have the strength to do what I need to do, that they will receive a very important Kabbalistic concept, a pidyon, a redemption, and be freed from their bondage in this life. Now, Chaim Vital was very serious about this. But if you think about it for a moment, what does this do? What, and I've tried this, okay, every so often when I think about it before I eat, while I'm eating, is that in Judaism, there are many things that we do from what's called our animal soul. We eat, we have physical needs, we have sexual needs. And Judaism says that we, by our high neshama level, have, and these are all nefesh ruach stuff, basic animalistic, we're animals. We're the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, animals, okay. But we have, and we're the only creatures, probably, that have the ability to do what? To take the animal and turn it into the godly, the holy. And thereby... When I do this with a piece of food or whatever, <clears throat> is that I'm put, putting myself by the consciousness of it into a cosmic process. Let's know something. There is something cosmic spiritual going on all the time, even when I'm eating. Now, you might say, why would you believe this? It's another new belief. It has to do with awareness of the infinite again in the finite. But going back now to the putting all this together, so to speak, if I could even do that, is remember, we have a person living, a person is terminally ill, 
and a person dies, and thereby their soul goes somewhere, Gan Eden, the Henum, and then there is the opportunity for them to somehow work the system out, work through the system, either through an incarnation by themselves or to do what's called an ebor. And also, as Chaim Vital pointed out, and other Kabbalistic teachers, have there ever been times in your life when you would say, how can I do that? I, I, I think I would be able to do that, master that thing. How did I do this? And and you say, oh, well, worked out, okay. Um, I was not good in any language. I took French in high school. I took German in college. I, I was a av very average student in both of them. I had no real, I, you couldn't say a language ability whatsoever. But I did very, very well in Hebrew. And basically, I almost taught myself initially, okay, uh, for the first two years of rabbinical school, I read nothing in English except what I had to. Everything was all Hebrew, everything. But how can I do that? How do I have these feelings that I have about Judaism, considering I came, I was, I was raised by definitely a secular slash reform family? Because I believe that that picture over there, my grandmother's grandfather, I believe that he is reincarnated into me. I have a part of his neshama. I actually look like him. Okay. When I met his son-in-law uh, at the age at the age of ninety, he was ninety-one in Pittsburgh. I uh, and um, the son-in-law had lived with the great with his grandfather-in-law uh, up until about the age of twenty-one, and then he came here nineteen forties, and he came here to America with many of his books that I now have is that when I made an appointment to meet with Aaron Kessler, who was a professor of Judaica at the University of, Pits of, 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 Pits of Pennsylvania, UP. And I came to his apartment, I knocked on the door, and Aaron, love of shalom, rest in peace, opened the door, he almost collapsed because he thought his, his great, great, he thought the rabbi, Turbo, Rev, Zev Wolf Turbo, was to come back to life. He almost collapsed, he almost fainted. I believe that he is incarnated in me because it's the only way to explain why I have the feelings that I do about anything that I do in, with all of you. I don't understand it. What are these books? What is, I don't understand it. But I'll add something else to it. Is, is that there is a book that I've been translating for the last 50 years called Mavi Evok. I have it before this class. I do that online an hour and a half every Thursday. And I'm the only person in the world translating this book. It's a Kabbalistic interpretation of rituals and ceremonies for visiting the sick, caring for the dead and the dying. I'm the only person in the world. And you could say, well, I must tra don't you translate anything else. It's the only book I have any facility with. Okay. Ability to translate. Is that Hebrew? Hebrew, yeah, Hebrew. It's the only book, I, but it's very high Kabbalistic, a lot of references and stuff, and the Kabbalistic ideas. It's the only book that I have any ease with. And therefore, I and I actually explained this to Rabbi Shear, uh, that I do believe that uh, Aaron Berechia, uh, who lived, uh, the book was printed in 1626 in Mantua, Italy. Uh, and um, I believe that a part of his nasham is incarnated in me and working through me. Okay. Now, you might say, wow, that's pretty chutzpah That's pretty arrogant to say. But on the other hand, I don't understand it. I don't understand why I could do this. Okay. It's the only book. Only, you only translate thing. other books. Nah, not very well. And I don't enjoy them. I don't, they don't speak for me. This book speaks for me. Some of you might have heard of the of the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch, I mentioned it briefly in the history part, was the Code of Jewish Law, um, one of the greatest of all from the 1500s, uh, written by a rabbi, uh, Joseph Cairo, uh, who was in Sfat in northern Israel. And he was visited, he believed, by the incarnation of the Mishnah. Not a person, but the, the Mishnah, Remember that great Jewish volume of Jewish law for uh, in the second, in the second, third century of the Common Era. In other words, thirteen hundred years before, and he believed that he wrote the entire Shulchan Aruch by channeling, to use another term, uh, the the Mishnah. So this is not an uncommon practice in Judaism. To and, he, and Joseph Cairo, even though he wrote one of the most comprehensive books on Jewish law, was also a mystic. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, 
Yeah. Oh, who's that? Oh, Doreen. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, one of the um, uh, attributes that when people ask me about you, one of the ones is how beautifully I feel, and many others, how you read the Torah and absolutely then tell us in English, translate it immediately thereafter with such ease. The only rabbi in all my years of all rabbis that I've been with that can do it so beautifully. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I really had to tell you that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, that was a lot of years of doing this, but yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Doreen. The good part. I like him. Do you feel like your grandfather is in great but if somebody is playing this game of hey if i die somebody's going to eat this sandwich and i'm going to get better sometimes <laughs> what what purpose does it have for someone who is not a nice person to become a good person if they know that you're going to eat that sandwich ah well the answer i'll give to that is guess what you don't know that okay. and what if you, you don't you since you don't know that to def to definitely, that somehow, no matter what bad, how bad you are now, you're going to have a number of lifetimes to figure this out and work this out. You, 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 Judaism has always emphasized the fact is, guess what? We're living right now. We know what we do have now. And these are, you can call these speculations, you can call them whatever you want to, but you have to live on that cusp. It's like in, in, the, in the Mishnah, it says, all is foreseen, but free will is given. So you, we're, in Judaism, we're constantly living on the cusp of contradictions. So you're right. Uh, but by the way, I would say, if there was a person who lived that way in order to take advantage of the system, they'd be really in bad shape the next time around. Well, yeah. well, there well, would be a rock and, on the thing. And just to follow up, that's with the assumption, right, that the person knows, is conscious mm -hmm. that they're in the sand. They, that they, they're... Then probably not even aware. It's not a conscious. It's not right. a conscious it's not a, thing. It's, right. The per, he's not in the sandwich saying, I'm glad I'm getting to eat. <laughs> he doesn't, you know, he's like, yeah, thank God, Rabbi right, right, <laughs> uh, he's, he's not aware of it. <laughs> what if the sandwich makes the rabbi sick? <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that's really a bad guy. Well, what happens to the bad guy? Get COVID. Well, <laughs> I'll have to channel look I'd be tall and ask him that. I don't know. Yeah, good question. That's funny. Um, I know. I think it's just very hard. It's just so hard to believe. Again, after all you've said, you're going to kill me. But that there is an afterlife. I, we all want to believe that there's an afterlife. And people have said they have gone and no, you have to go back. And you know, all that, those stories, we've heard all those stories, but um, I don't know. I always talk to my mom and she never talks back to me. And I don't get any sign or anything. Uh, well, you know, I, I always, you know, I'm hoping. <laughs> well, but the idea too is that part of her neshama is in your neshama. She is you. Yeah. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rabbi, you gave us the assignment to read. I, I have one one thing, uh, just as a comment, I, I take exception to the book because I actually read the assignment and that we've been here, I don't know how long, it could be 10 minutes, it could be an hour and a half. This book didn't deal with anything up to 85 about the afterlife. It stopped when the person died. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's why you need me. Well, I know, but, <laughs> but it would, I mean, it's so important because most of us don't have an understanding. That next no. time a book will talk about well, there's, it. yeah, there's only so much. Yeah, that's don't forget that book is from a reformed tra the tr reformed tradition. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's a there's a rabbi uh, that I know, Simcha Raphael, who's written numerous books on the Jewish afterlife. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um. So, notice though how in this system all is necessary because you have to have this reincarnation process in order to give a sense of being able to rectify the things that we have committed. But going back to Hannah's statement, can you know these things? Well, some people feel they do, okay? Obviously, I, I feel this. Um, I feel a very powerful part, I do believe in reincarnation. Uh, and whether it's uh, my own self 
trying to feel better about death. That's a psychological understanding. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I've had certain experiences in my life. Uh, my father has come to me in my dreams at times. Uh -huh. uh, and it's felt as real as real. But doesn't mean that's good or bad. I'm just saying. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, my sister's third child, his name was Paul. Uh, Paul uh, was named after our grandmother, who lived to 92. Her name was Paula. And baby Paul died in its sleep at 17 months old. Huh. And I never said, uh, maybe later on, I said this to my sister. Um, but it, looking back at this, I would try to see it as a form of reincarnation, that Grandma Paula's soul needed to come back for a short period of time to do something. And it fulfilled its mission and then left and went back to wherever it came from. And is that com comforting? Well, to realize in, in all of these things, why should we believe in any of this? Because for, it, it brings us past the fact is that we're only finite creatures. And the fact is, again, maybe like that Sufi mystic said, the fact is we can even think of these things. Does that not indicate somewhat of the validity of them? Because why should we think of them at all? Obviously, someone like Freud or someone could say, yeah, because basically afraid of death and total annihilation of existence. The, the, the expression, well, when you're dead, you're dead. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that we have many people have had experiences or a feeling that there is something more than this. And you constantly see this in nature. All of nature, all of time is cyclical. Uh, this is winter in Florida. Um, and there's going to be a spring. There's going to be a fall. Uh, the, the grass uh, dies and the grass comes back to life again. Everything in life, in nature, is cyclical. There's death and birth and rebirth all of the time. And so, therefore, why not with our soul? Um, there was a rabbi, Chernikovsky, who got a, that came up with this lovely parable. You have twins in their mother's womb, obviously, before birth. And everything is wonderful there. They have no idea of time, none at all. And it's great. They have, they're swimming around. They have all the food they want. Everything is comfy-dory. The temperature is perfect. They, uh, the thermostat works perfectly in mom. Everything is great. And all of a sudden, they feel some tremoring going on and, and, and movement in there. And they're rocking and rolling. What's going on here? And the muscles are contracting and this and that. And all of a sudden, and all of a sudden one of them goes like that and is gone. So the one that's still left at that moment in second in time, it starts to cry and says, oh, my God, my brother is dead. He's gone. Uh, what, he, he's no more. I'll never see him again. And all of a sudden, whoosh, the other one comes flying. Ladies, if you gave birth, I'm sorry to describe the birth process this way. I don't mean to belittle the pain you went through. OK, but anyway, maybe just whoosh, like that. And little did the first one who is still left in there know that his brother was being greeted, greeted to the words Mazel Tov and welcome into life. And how do we not know that on that the Sitra Aqua is actually called in Hebrew, the other side is what the Sitra Aqua means. The other side that we're not being, being greeted by all of our loved ones, your mom, my, my mom and dad, your family, the by the words welcome. Um, and by the way, in, in Mavi Aboka, in the book that I translated, describes very specifically that there are going to be an angelic chorus there. And they're going to be singing to us, Shalom Aleichem, uh, welcome in peace. And... Does that make it any better? Well, we, we shouldn't make it totally better because you shouldn't want to leave this world. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't want to leave our loved ones. But the fact is to know that Judaism does believe that our loved ones do have an existence in another dimension and they are aware of us at this very moment in time. That's And I'll talk about the customs and many of them. For instance, saying Kaddish. Kaddish is said for 11 months from the time of a person dies. However, there is a tradition of saying Kaddish for 12 months for people who are not nice. Why? We Many people think, and I'm going to have to spend more time next time on, on some of these customs for, on uh, mourning and stuff. I didn't get that far today, uh, to that part. But I think we covered, I covered a lot, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, it made you think about a lot of things, right? Uh, that's the whole point of this, is... Many of the customs of mourning, we're told, are for the living, okay? However, actually, many of the customs are for the dead. Again, think about it. The neshama has, like a rocket ship, has taken off. 
But the neshama, according to our tradition, needs the help of the living to move forward into the spiritual world. The neshama, I'll talk about myself personally, my mom and dad, Doris and Ira, they needed our, my help to help to move their neshama forward in the, in the next dimension, in the other worlds. And so one way of doing that, like a booster rocket, okay, from Cape Canaveral, right? It, Cape Kenny, where they call thing now. Okay, um, the, the booster rocket is my saying Kaddish. Now, according to the tradition, if the person was miserable and not a nice person, okay, it might be my grilled cheese sandwich next time around. <laughs> um, but anyway, that person needs a lot of help from the from their family and loved ones to get further on, to get them out of Gehenna. So therefore, you say Kaddish for 12 months for a not nice person. Who decides that? Yeah. You have to. Yeah. And then the other hand, for everybody else, you say it only 11 months. That's why 11, not 12. It's forbidden to say it for 12, unless you think in my class before, the Mavi Abo class, the translation class, uh, one of the students, and they're all, by the way, they're all on the West Coast, which is interesting, California, Colorado, Portland, uh, is is that um, one of the one of them? Uh, we're talking about saying Kaddish and and more and being in mourning and shiva, and he said his father was a terrible, terrible. Uh, no, sorry, his mother is a terrible, terrible person, and he has already told her. First of all, she's told him when I die, I want you at the funeral, and he said to her, "Guess what? I don't want to be there." I mean, imagine this woman is ninety something. And they had this horrible relationship. It's sad, to say the least. And he was talking about, is he obligated to say Kaddish? He doesn't want to say Kaddish for her. He's already told he's not going to say Kaddish for her. And I said to him, you know, Jewish tradition doesn't concern itself with your emotions. You're grieving, or you're not grieving, or your anger. <clears throat> Jewish tradition says, no matter what your feelings are, you still say Kaddish. But I think I made him feel better. I said, well, good, say 12 months for her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but but the fact is <clears throat> that what we do affects the dead, and as well as obviously they watch for us. <clears throat> um, there was a Rabbi Nachmanides uh, who lived also fifteen hundreds, and he was in Spain, uh, and he was a great commentator to the Torah and other books, and also a Kabbalist and a myth, and uh, also philosopher, and very similar to Socrates, he said he wasn't afraid to die. Uh, he didn't commit suicide like Socrates did, uh, but he was not afraid to die because he would be. He was looking forward to the time when he could meet Moses and all of the great people who lived before him and talk about Jewish philosophy and Torah forever. Well, you can say, well, Rabbi, that's a nice idea, isn't it? Well, who knows? I always have believed, my, I've lived my life based upon the idea, since we can't prove spiritual things or events, then guess what? Why not believe it? Hmm. OK, because you can't prove them wrong. But if you can't prove them right, why not believe them and make make your life a better one? Because you understand that there's more to life than simply what you see. And guess what? What you do in life does make a difference, not only for this life, which you'd like to believe, but the world, but the net, but the olam haba, the world to come. Yeah. So um, whew, I'm exhausted. Well, it's actually how it's actually I've been here since one o'clock teaching um, anyway. Um, we'll do is do you want do you mind if we extend it to another week to class two weeks more? Okay, yeah, because I haven't gotten to God yet. I did get to God, but yeah, so back door. Um, so anyway, so next week I'm going to continue the morning customs, shiva and all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, and also talk about sickness. Okay. And reading for next week. Um, oh, you can start reading my, the last book. God is with me. I have no fear. It's, it's written by his strange rabbi. Yeah, strange, it? strange or paradise. How far should we go? Oh, Larry. Who, Larry? Who, Larry? Who? Oh, Larry. Oh, you have a question? Larry. His hand is up. Okay. Anyway, start reading your book. Yeah, read my. Yeah, read the book. That's my book, and uh, just. It's, and and also you'll notice the way the way I wrote read the way I wrote each chapter was there's like a workbook in each one uh, to re reflect back on what I say and, and have fun with it. Okay, it's, it's, it's a workbook. And basically, I describe different experiences I've had with God over my life, uh, and ask you to see in your life if you if this, if this um, uh, strikes a chord of some sort. It's all about Absolutely. faith. About yeah. about faith and about 
you know, absolutely believing that there is more than the, than yeah. than what we see. Definitely. And you'll definitely have a viewer sandwich the same way. <laughs> Everyone, hi, Doreen. Goodbye. Okay, see you all. Have a lovely. Oh, yeah. oh. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a lovely Finally. rest of the week. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you see you, Doreen. <clears throat> Rabbi, from a from oh, different vantage point, it went to um, Buddhist. And then it went to the And then it went to the It's really tough to see. Oh, yeah. That's, the story, that's the story, that's the story, story is the disciple goes up to the Buddha. It's like, you know, enlightened being and start saying, you know, uh, good, I've been thinking about my past life. Let me, like, let me not sure what, what I was and I'm having confusion and, and, and I'm thinking this and that I did this.